And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries and welcome to Second Chances here at Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis, and this is our weekly program in which if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and you've made that ultimate decision to say, you know what, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. Then you do understand that God loved us so much that he gave us that second chance by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross that we can have life and have it more abundantly, and you just never know that, uh, always know that once you make that decision, even in the toughest of times, that God is always with you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are going to give you an opportunity before this very half hour is done to ask Him to be the Lord of your life. And we are privileged to have wonderful guests with us each and every week, and uh, some amazing people have been on this program and have come and share their their story, their situation, their book, whatever the case may be. And we have one of those wonderful guests with us today. Her name is Anna Christina. And Anna, thank you very much for joining us here on Second Chances. We appreciate it. Thank you, Greg, for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. Well, it's an honor to have you on our program as well. So as I look over your notes here, it says that you currently live in a quiet suburban neighborhood surrounded by your loving and supportive children, and you even formerly held a position of a chief financial officer, but now you've uh, dedicated your life to being an ambassador for the Lord and uh, working on projects to build a holistic shelter for the homeless and broken of spirit. Now, obviously, when someone is selling out for the Lord, so to speak, such as you are, uh, we've been through things, and... Uh, obviously, one of the things you've been through is what we're going to talk about today, correct? I'm sorry, Greg, you got cut off for the last few minutes. Okay. What I was basically saying is it talks about, uh, Anna, that uh, you are dedicated to being an ambassador for the Lord, and obviously, once you make that decision to sell out for the Lord, uh, usually because the Lord has brought you to a situation where you're desperate for Him and you need Him and things like that, and obviously, that's what we're going to talk about today, some of the things uh, you've been through uh, to, uh, as far as our conversation about your book, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, Anna, give us a little bit of background of who you are and where you're from. Greg, I was born in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, raised to a Coptic Orthodox family. Coptic Orthodox is very similar to Greek and Russian Orthodox. And then we migrated to Canada when I was about seven years old. And I went to school in Canada, grew up there, got my CGA, which is uh, similar to CPA in the States from Canada. And I lived in Canada till about 25 years old. Then I moved to the States. And in the States, I held positions as CFO, Director of Finance, was married, and have been living in the States ever since. Now, when you made that decision to your family move to Canada, was there circumstances that caused your family to move to Canada or just a, a fresh start? No, well, actually the circumstances were my younger brother was mentally handicapped, and in Egypt they do not recognize that very well, and they don't know how to deal with it. So my family uh, decided to migrate to Canada to seek better care for him. So that's why we migrated uh, so long ago. Now, even though you left Egypt and went to Canada and eventually the United States, have you been back to visit Egypt uh, since those uh, early days? Yes, I have been, yes. I love going and visiting there. Um, obviously, uh, you're a Christian today. Uh, tell us how God became the Lord of your life. Tell us your story. Well, the Lord has always been uh, the Lord of my life, uh, but I became really close to Him. That I can recognize being a born again as opposed to being a Coptic Orthodox Christian. And I started going to non denomination churches, Calvary churches. And I remember uh, reading a book um, called.
called Positive Thinking. I can't remember the author. And that book changed my life. The statement, the first chapter said, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. And I really took that statement to heart. And it changed my life ever since. Um, So that was the beginning of my being a born-again Christian. Being a born-again Christian, is that uncommon, somewhat common, or not common at all in Egypt? Not common at all in Egypt. Uh, how, how was it that your family was able to uh, put you in a position to become a Christian, uh, even even with the culture that you're from? Um, it wasn't my family as much as it was me who was seeking the Lord. I was suffering through um, a very um, stressful marriage, with my first husband, who was a Coptic Orthodox, but uh, he didn't walk the talk. He was more religious, going to church every day, almost uh, fasting, doing the religious things, but was not practicing Christianity. It was very um, controlling, very uh, demeaning, continuously put me down, just broke my spirit. Um, I later learned that he was uh, his character was narcissistic, and I was just seeking the Lord with all my heart at that time uh, because I was struggling so much in that marriage. And then I had the strength to leave to walk out, file a restraining order, and I was able to divorce him after 13 years of marriage. That's uh, quite a long time to be in a situation like that. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of times, a lot of times, Anna will will have a, a guest on the program, and uh, will will actually uh, bring out the name of the book that the person writes uh, very early in the interview. But because of the the, the title of your book that uh, we're going to talk about, really talks about your situation. Um, before I give the title of the book, why don't you tell our listeners? what happened to you that kind of led to this book? Well, after my divorce with my first husband, my first love found me. He was the first love that I loved uh, when I was 14, but I was forbidden to marry him because he was a non-Christian. As a matter of fact, he was a Muslim. And I was a Christian, and my family being a Christian Orthodox, it was just um, forbidden or just not acceptable for me to marry uh, a Muslim man. So we separated, and about 25 years later, he found me. He dissected the state I was living in block by block and found me, called me, and uh, we fell in love all over again. Uh, I found in him the character that I was always looking for, the kindness, the listener, the sweetness. He, he just was everything I was looking for. And I was empty and um, hungry for a kind man at the time. So it didn't matter that he was Muslim anymore. I stayed in my religion and I thought, okay, I will bring him. To know the Lord. We got married a year later, and we lived happily for about nine years. He became actually my soulmate, my best friend, didn't need anybody else. We didn't have children. I had children from my previous husband. I had a daughter and a son. But I lived with Sam for about nine years, and he took care of all my needs, but I was the breadwinner. I, as a director or a CFO, I made the money. He stayed home. He was struggling with the English language. And he stayed home taking care of all our needs, and I was fine with that. And then about nine years into the marriage, um, something was starting not to click in. I, starting, I was running out of money. I was supporting his ex-wife and his two daughters in Egypt. And they were going to medical school. 
I didn't have enough money left over to even take care of my own kids. But six months before I realized that, the Lord gave me a warning and spoke to me in a way and told me that he was not blessing this marriage. And when he did this, I, I was heartbroken, Greg, because I really loved that man. But I loved the Lord more. And when I realized he was not blessing the marriage, and it was very clear, I broke down, went on my knees, and I asked the Lord, and I prayed, and I said, God, if you are not blessing this marriage, then take this man away, but don't break my heart, because I loved him so much. And as the days went by, my heart got hardened towards this man day by day. And after six months passed, I was no longer in love with this man, which was amazing because I was addicted to this man. I couldn't imagine my life without him. But after six months, around December of 2008, I was able to talk to him and tell him that I wanted a divorce, that I could no longer support him and his kids, and he needed to find somebody else. We even joked that he should find a sugar mama because I could no longer support him. Well, we went and filed for a divorce, an amicable divorce, where in six months, if none of us disputed, it becomes final. But he asked to stay in the apartment for three weeks after the divorce until he finds a place to move to. And I agreed to do that. The day after my divorce, I started getting very, very ill. I woke up with severe headaches where I couldn't move my head. I couldn't even blink without hurting. It was tremendous pain all over my body, but the head was the worst. He took me, he finally agreed to take me to a clinic where the doctor didn't run much tests and said that I'm coming down with the flu. They gave me some painkillers. And then Sam started giving me his blood pressure medicine. Well, his blood pressure medicine took down the pressure from my head, so I was able to function again. And I don't have blood pressure, so I never took blood pressure medicine, but it helped the situation. And I had stayed home for two weeks with all these aches and pains, but then I was able to go back to work. And the morning of January 9th, 2009, I, as I was driving to work, I got a vision. As I'm driving, and I've never had a vision before in my life, and that vision, somebody was dying in my family, and I assumed it was my younger brother that we had talked about earlier, the mentally handicapped one. So I decided I needed to go to Egypt to see him before he dies. I thought it was a warning from God uh, that I should go and spend some time with him. So as soon as I went to the office, I made arrangements, to fly out the next day, which was Saturday, and I also made another reservation to leave on Sunday. I called Sam. I told him, I have to leave to Egypt tomorrow or the day after, and he said, fine. And then I took care of work, and I, as if a force was telling me to just go home around 6 o'clock, it, like work wasn't ending. I was trying to delegate everything. But as if something was telling me, just leave everything and go home now and stop thinking. So I did uh, just that. And I drove home. And as I was walking up to my apartment, a voice came out of nowhere. But a clear voice spoke to me in my mind clearly as I'm talking to you right now, and revealed himself to me, and it was the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I never before could relate to the Holy Spirit. I could relate to Jesus, knowing that we've seen him in movies, but never could understand the Holy Spirit. But it was the Holy Spirit. And he asked me to shut my mouth and not to say, anything that was going on and what was happening right now that he was talking to me. And he made 
um, like a sign to just keep my mouth shut. And I continued walking up to my apartment. Sam greeted me. He asked me if I was leaving tomorrow or the day after. I said, I don't know. I'm not going to think today. I'll let you know tomorrow. He said, okay, I'll prepare dinner. Just go change. And I went to my room, changed. My daughter came out to greet me, went back to her room. And I walked back in the kitchen, and Sam offered me a plate with food. He had rice, and he cooked beans, a French bean casserole for me. I wasn't hungry, so I I asked to remove the beans, and I was just going to eat the rice. And as I was standing there, the voice of the comforter said, open the fridge and put plain yogurt on your rice. Now, this is a dish we eat in Egypt. We put plain yogurt with our rice. But when he asked me to do that, I, I was shocked, and I said, do you care about the yogurt I put on my rice? Like, to me, it was such a trivial thing that he would take the time to ask me to do it. And he responded and said, child, I'm in every little detail of your life. And I was in awe when he said that. Because I felt I missed out on him for about 50 years. I missed out on a being who, was in, who is and was in every little detail of my life. I just felt shame. But I did do as he asked. I put the yogurt on my rice, and I went and sat down and ate. And I remembered the Holy Spirit had such a sweet sense of humor that he started cracking jokes. And I started laughing and giggling as I was sitting to the point that my husband turned to me and he said, did you stop by somewhere to have a drink? And I didn't even respond to him. I didn't want to break the conversation I was having with the Holy Spirit. And I finished my dinner, and the comforter asked me to just go retire to sleep and... I did that. I said good night and I went to my bed. And I was as I was laying down. The comforter said, "Child, it's not your brother. It is you." And Greg, I don't know if anybody is ever ready to hear that that it is you. Something was going to happen to me. I wasn't ready for that at all. I My heart started aching. Up in the morning and find me dead in my bed. Just broke my heart. The news to my son, he was only 18 and Colleen was only 14. I was just in awe of... Now that they were starting to live with me, I heartbroken. And then the comforter said, child, you're going on a journey, and you'll come back, and you will be my ambassador. And as soon as I heard that statement, I was just so relieved, and I could breathe again. So it was like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm ready, you know, to go on any journey. That's all you do. Stop thinking. And I said, okay, I can do that. I tried to stop thinking. It to do to stop thinking. I kept thinking whether I was going to think or not, or whether I'm still thinking or not, or did I stop thinking or not. And my brain kept on going and going, and finally I got it to stop thinking. And then I said, I'm ready now, Lord. What do you want me to do? And he said, shut your eyes, and no matter what happens, do not open your eyes. And I did so, and I shut my eyes. And as soon as I shut my eyes, a 
bright light was turned on in my room. It was so bright. I felt the presence of God the Father. But I wouldn't dare open my eyes. And then the window started rattling and shaking as if there was an earthquake. And then my heart started pounding. It started with a, a mild, like, palpitation, but then it was pounding, and then started pounding harder, and it scared me. And I got so scared that the whole process shut down. All of a sudden, my heart stopped beating, the window stopped rattling, and the light was turned off again. And I thought I screwed it up. That, shoot, God, did I just screw it up? Did I mess up my death? And he said, child, this one you can't mess up. Actually, he said, this one you can't screw up. We just have to start over again, and you have to relax more and stop thinking and relax. And I said, okay. And he took me through the process again. And he said, you have to shut your eyes, and again, don't. And I did just that. And the bright light came, and the window started rattling again, and my heart started beating. But this time, it was bouncing so hard, I thought my chest was going to break open, and my heart was going to jump out. But I knew what to expect, so I wasn't scared. And it kept on going for I don't know how long, and then everything was quiet. And I wasn't dead. But then the Lord said, Okay, child, the next uh, few minutes are going to be an annoyance. The next step is going to be an annoyance. I want you to think it's only an annoyance. And it will pass. I said, okay. And suddenly the pain, in my body, but particularly in my legs, was so excruciating as if somebody was taking a sledgehammer and was breaking down my bones. And it was so painful, but he kept saying, it's an annoyance, child, it's an annoyance. It will pass, it's an annoyance. Him coaching me step by step made me endure that pain. And I was able to endure it, and it was okay. And then the pain stopped, and I was relieved. I was so happy that there was no more pain. But then I realized there was no pain, but there was no more feelings either. I didn't feel anything. I felt numb from my head to my toes. And I said, to the Holy Spirit, I said, am I paralyzed? And he responded, yes, child, you are. And I just groaned, and I said, oh. And I asked him, oh, can I at least move my toe? And he said, go ahead, child, try. You know, but he knew I couldn't, and I tried, and I couldn't. And I just laid down there, paralyzed. And that's when my husband walked in the room. And I thought he's going to notice that I'm paralyzed, but he didn't. He just went to sleep. And I spent the whole night with the comforter. It was the most beautiful night in my life. It didn't matter that I was paralyzed. It didn't matter I was going to die or not or where I was going to go. I had him by my side, and it was the sweetest night ever. He downloaded the Bible. He answered questions I've always had, but I didn't have to ask him again. He just knew all my questions and explained everything to me. He was the best tutor ever. He explained everything so simple and logical and just, it was, I had night, the night, um, that night I had visions and dreams, but then in the middle of the night, I felt like I needed 
to go number one. And I asked him, I said, I need to go to the restroom. But I couldn't move. And he said, go, child. And I realized I just had to do it there in my bed. And I, my body was draining so much fluid. I thought I was going to drown in it. Or maybe my husband would wake up. But he didn't. And then early in the morning, around dawn, I I felt the light in the room. And my husband woke up, and he tried to wake me up. And I said, okay, now he's going to realize that I'm paralyzed. He's going to call 911. He turned around. I wasn't responding as he was waking me up. He tried opening my eyes, moving my arms, and I wasn't responding. He turned, he came around the bed, and took off my gold watch, which I didn't understand. Why was he taking off my jewelry? And then he put a pill in my mouth, and it was a Xanax pill. But because I was paralyzed, my teeth were locked up together, and he was forcefully putting the Xanax through my teeth. And he successfully did that, and then he put a mint in my mouth. And I was wondering, why is he putting a mint instead of calling 911? I couldn't have been smelling that bad. But then he turned around, went on top of the bed, and touched me and said, oh, you're all wet. I need to get you out of these clothes. So I said, okay, he's so kind. He's going to take my clothes off before he calls 911. But instead of doing that, he went on top of me and started raping me. And I couldn't understand what was going on because he's never touched me like that. We've always been clean and jump in the shower before we'd get intimate together and put lotion. And and here I am with all that urine in my body, in my hair, and paralyzed, and he's raping me instead of calling 911. Then he was done and went into the shower And he came out of the shower, and I could hear that he was running water in the bathtub for me. He was filling the bathtub for me. And he came around to carry me in the bathtub, but he couldn't carry me. I was too heavy, and he dropped me on the floor. And I ended up in the corner of the room, curled up naked on the floor. And he left the room. And I could hear my daughter woke up in her bedroom because I could hear the TV was on. So he must have gone to attend to her. I later found out from her that she, he told her that I'm in my room, uh, don't want to be disturbed. I took a few Xanax. I'm upset over my younger brother dying in Egypt, and I don't want to be disturbed. And that's how he kept her away from my room. And... uh, He came back into the room, and I felt ice-cold water on my body, like needles were shocking through my body, and I couldn't understand, what is he doing? And as these needles were on my body, I saw a vision of Jesus' hand on the floor with them piercing the nail in his hand. And as it was piercing in his hand, and as the water was piercing in my body, I was able to endure that uncomfort and pain, just seeing the pain that Jesus was going through. And I was able to endure it until it stopped, and I was thankful it stopped. Then he left the room, came back after I don't know how long, and he did the same thing again. And he poured ice-cold water over my naked body. And again, I saw Jesus' hand, and I was able to endure that pain. And then he left again. And I'm laying on on the floor, wondering why isn't he calling 911. And then he came back in. And this time, he went over my body, and he put his fingers over my nose, and he held my nose shut that I couldn't breathe. But even though I was paralyzed, my mouth uh, opened up, uh, grasping for air, and that startled him when my mouth opened up, and he let go of my nose, and he left the room again. 
and this is when I was realizing something's wrong when he's doing this to me, and I remembered my life insurance. I had a million-dollar life insurance, and he was the beneficiary of half a million dollars. And this is when I realized something was going on wrong. And he walked back in the, in the room, and he did the same thing again, and he held my nose tight. And again, I grasped for air, and again he got startled, and he left the room. And he came back later, but this time he decided to hold my nose tight, and he put his hand over my mouth and covered my mouth, and he wasn't letting go. He was doing it in a gentle manner, but he wasn't moving his hands, and I couldn't breathe. It was so uncomfortable not being able to breathe. But I saw as uncomfortableness was there, and he's holding, he kept his hand on my mouth and nose. This is when I saw Jesus, but I could only see up to his knees through his robe, and he had his arm stretched towards me, and I was singing to him, I am not letting go. I will never let go. And I knew that was it because I couldn't breathe anymore. And I, But just my soul just kept on going, you know, like, I felt that I died. I looked back and my body was there, but I just kept on going. Greg, are you still there? I I I, I am there and after after that situation, what happened next? I saw beautiful white clouds and they opened up. And I saw bright blue sky. And around the sky, there were big animals with so much color that were flying around the sky. Uh, they were big, huge birds or animals with big um, wings flying around the sky. And then the sky opened up, and I found myself in a garden and in the garden there was weddings and at first I thought it was my wedding you know I died I went to heaven and it's my wedding but it wasn't my wedding it was somebody else's wedding but I couldn't see who it was I couldn't see the bride and then I walked in I found myself walking in to a hallway and at the door of that hallway I saw my mother and she greeted me, and my mother was a body of light. I couldn't see her face. She didn't have the features she had on earth, but I recognized her soul right away. She was the same height as she was on earth, but just bright, and I knew it was my mother. And she took me in. I didn't hug her. She just took me in, and I saw my sister who had died when she was 35. But actually, it was, I was so thrilled to see my sister, Greg, because my sister had committed suicide at the age of 35. So seeing her in heaven was the most precious thing ever because I always wondered where she went, but I knew she knew the Lord and loved the Lord, but she was depressed when she took her life. And it was just a confirmation that we have a and she was enjoying heaven and I just went in a room with her and I told her Nadia I can't contain this I, there's just so much joy I can't I'm just overwhelmed I don't know what to do with myself and she said Anna with Jesus it keeps on getting better and I couldn't imagine it getting any more better than this. And she walked me out of this room, and then my father was there. And my father had been killed in, an ar in a car accident uh, when I was younger. And I was just thrilled to see him, my mother, and my sister. And we were just standing there together communicating. I don't know how. We weren't talking, but we were communicating. And they said, 
they're going to a banquet with Jesus. And I was saying, oh, my gosh, Jesus, are you guys kidding me? I'm going to see Jesus. But they went on, and I didn't follow them. I was so stupid. I don't know what happened to me. I didn't follow them, and I missed out on that banquet. But I found, found myself going to another room, and in that room there was the ex-pope of our Coptic Orthodox Church, Pope Corollos. He had died a long time ago, just a sweet, down-to-earth, holy, like spiritual man. And he said to me, child, where have you been? Child, we've been waiting for you. Where have you been? And I looked at him, and I was embarrassed because I had left the Coptic Church uh, for about 10 years after I was married to the Muslim, uh, and I was going to Calvary. So I said, you know, Pope, I was, you know, I stopped going to the Coptic Church. I've been going to Calvary. And he goes, why, child, why? And I said, well, I haven't found much love and kindness in the Coptic Church. And he goes, Anna, what is your name? And I said my name in Egyptian. And he said, what does it mean, child? And my name in Egyptian means kindness. And he said, you're looking for kindness outside, child, but you are what we need in here. Hurry up. There is not much time left. Hurry up, child. Hurry up. There's no time. And he rushed me out. And as he rushed me out, this is when Jesus revealed his face to me. And he revealed it slowly from his forehead to his eyes and to his nose, but it took him a long time to reveal his nose because he had a long nose. And right away I said, you are Jewish, aren't you? And he just smiled with the biggest smile, and he revealed the rest of his face. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I saw his face, this is when I came back, and I, I could see the freeway underneath me, and... The land underneath looked very dry compared to where I was. And then I was back in my room, and then I saw my body, and Sam had my body still naked. He was crying over it. And then I jumped back in my body, and I was no longer paralyzed, and I jumped out of bed, and you should have seen the look on his face. And once, once he jumped, you jumped back into your body. Uh, how did you get out of that situation? It took a while, but we finally ended up. Uh, I talked uh, Colleen into calling the police, and we got the police there. But uh, because I was no longer paralyzed, there was no evidence of any abuse or anything, and I couldn't tell anybody what had just happened about my encounter because the Lord had asked me not to say anything. So there was no evidence of anything. So everybody assumed I'm having a mental breakdown, uh, a nervous breakdown, and that I was overworked being a CFO of three companies and just having a nervous breakdown. So somehow he convinced everybody of that and they ended up putting me in a mental hospital. Uh, and I was there for about nine days. But eventually I was able to leave uh, when my sister, my other sister, came and got me. We managed to get him out of the house. Um, I was able to go to court and because during that time my first husband was able to take my daughter away from me claiming that I'm walking around the house naked and I had a mental breakdown. So we went to court, proved that uh, what had happened is a doctor asked me to get a hair analysis to figure out what had happened to me. And we did do a hair analysis, and it found out I had heavy dosage of barium in my hair three months later. I had 2,700, the dosage that a normal person would have. And barium is uh, found in rat poisoning. So he was poisoning me, especially after we filed a divorce. He was giving it to me in my coffee day by day. 
and you can't smell it because barium is odorless and tasteless. And when he found out I was going to Egypt that night, he must have given me a much heavier dosage that night to finish me off that night so I wouldn't go to Egypt and I wouldn't get sick in Egypt or because his time at home was running out. So he knew he had to kill me that day. And that's why I got paralyzed that day. Mm. And barium causes paralysis. Uh, What happens, your whole body goes into paralysis and then your heart stops because of the paralysis. Your heart Mm. heart stops Mm. uh, beating. And that was his plan. And when I wasn't dying, he was trying to put me in the bathtub, but I was too heavy for that. So then he decided to finish me off with Mm. his hands. Mm. An incredible story. The name of the book, My Sweet Encounter with Death, the author, Anna Christina. And Anna, we have just, we've actually went over time, but such an important story you shared with us and such a such a wonderful experience you had with the Holy Spirit. The question I have for you is, there are people out there that are searching, searching for that hope, searching for that freedom. And the only way to get that hope, to get that freedom, is to have Jesus be the Lord of your life. And would you be willing right now, Anna, to lead our listeners that are ready to accept Jesus Christ to be the Lord of their life to do so? Would you do that right now? I'd be honored, Greg. Uh, um, if you are out there and you don't know the Lord, or you know Him and you've drifted away from Him, Please say this prayer with me. You can repeat after me, but think about the words you're saying. God, Holy Father, I want to know you. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to give you all my life, Lord. But I've sinned, and you know it all, Lord. Please forgive me for all my sins, Lord, the ones I've done knowingly and the ones I've done unknowingly, Lord. Please touch my heart, touch my soul. Let me know you. Reveal yourself to me, Lord. I want to know you. Come into my heart now, Lord. Save me. Be a big part of my life. Be my life, Lord. I ask you this now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Our guest on Second Chances has been Anna Christina, the author of My Sweet Encounter with Death. Real quick, Anna, if someone would like to learn more about the book or learn about you, is there a website that one could do so? Yes, uh, my website is mysweetencounterwithdeath.com, and they can contact me through that. They can get my books through Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's on a lot, of, a lot of sites. But I would love to hear from your listeners and my readers. And we thank you very much, Anna, for sharing your story with us and uh, blessing us with your experience with the Holy Spirit. Once again, our author, Anna Christina, My Sweet Encounter with Death. And remember the website, MySweetEncounterWithDeath.com. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries.